Korea isn't just more colorful language. The United States has great strength and patience. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. U.S. President Trump's remark to totally destroy North Korea if the regime threatens the U.S. or its allies has sent shockwaves in South Korea. While Trump is well known for his strong and non-conventional rhetoric, his first address to the U.N. is perceived to be extraordinary. It wasn't expected that President Trump will come out with great rhetoric at the United Nations, but Trump's words reflected the strong will that the U.S. will not sit and watch North Korea's threat. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. The United States is ready, willing and able, but hopefully this will not be necessary. A South Korean foreign ministry official cautioned against reading too much between the lines of Trump's speech and rather said that the U.S. president underscored the need for the international community to fully implement sanctions on the reclusive regime. Experts are now speculating over North Korea's possible response to Trump's U.N. speech. as the regime has a record of hitting back aggressively at Trump's words. After the U.S. president threatened the North in early August with fire and fury like the world has never seen before, Pyongyang dismissed such warning as a load of nonsense and outlined plans to strike the U.S. territory of Guam in the Pacific Ocean. It is time for North Korea to realize that the denuclearization is its only acceptable future. The United Nations Security Council recently held two unanimous 15 to nothing votes adopting hard-hitting resolutions against North Korea. And I want to thank China and Russia for joining the vote to impose sanctions, along with all of the other members of the Security Council. Thank you to all involved. But we must do much more. It is time for all nations to work together to isolate the Kim regime until it ceases its hostile behavior. A statement by South Korean President Moon Jae-in Wednesday referred to President Donald Trump's denunciation of North Korean behavior as portraying a firm and specific stance on the key issues regarding keeping peace and safety. It said Mr. Trump's remarks clearly showed how seriously the United States government views North Korea's nuclear program. Japanese Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga said he believes it is necessary to have strong deterrence, and he highly appreciates the position that all options are on the table expressed by President Trump. Speaking for the first time as president to the UN General Assembly Tuesday, Mr. Trump denounced the regime of Kim Jong-un as depraved, showing contempt for both other nations and the well-being of its own people. It is responsible for the starvation deaths of millions of North Koreans and for the imprisonment, torture, killing and oppression of countless more. Now North Korea's reckless pursuit of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles threatens the entire world with unthinkable loss of human life. It is an outrage that some nations would not only trade with such a regime, but would arm, supply, and financially support a country that imperils the world with nuclear conflict. No nation on Earth has an interest in seeing this band of criminals arm itself with nuclear weapons and missiles. But Asian Studies professor Jeff Kingston of Temple University in Tokyo tells VOA's Victor Beatty the man on the streets of the Japanese capital would think this was not a wise speech to make. Threatening Kim may play well for Trump's base, but in terms of productively addressing the situation, it doesn't seem to mark any progress. Of course, the governments of South Korea and Japan want to portray solidarity. They view the alliance with the United States as great protection for them. And so there have been huge differences, particularly between Seoul and Washington, on how to move forward on dealing with the crisis. 
But I think that if you look at a lot of Japanese, uh, given the nuclear experience in Japan, Trump's threatening annihilation of North Korea don't go down well with people on the street. I think it's clear that the governments want to show solidarity and that they are united. The alliance is close, but I don't think, particularly in South Korea, that they think that Trump's position is a productive way to deal with the situation. One North Korea analyst in Washington said that with those words, President Trump handed the regime of Kim Jong-un the soundbite of the century. It will play on a continuous loop on North Korean state television. Yes, in terms of the propaganda of Pyongyang, the existential threat from the United States has long been a staple. We are surrounded, we're threatened, and so this strengthens the hand of the regime at home. China's foreign ministry on Wednesday said China supports a peaceful resolution to the North Korean matter. In an op-ed piece in the People's Daily, Curtis Stone writes, The Korean Peninsula is on edge, made more so by words and actions that worsen tensions. Mr. Trump's political chest-thumping is unhelpful. It will only push the DPRK to pursue even riskier policies because the survival of the regime is at stake. Yes, Trump is throwing fuel on the fire. And to the extent that he threatens the regime, the regime is going to double up and continue with its weapons program because they realize that that is the only thing keeping them in the game. Jeff Kingston said he believes Asian leaders want a cooling down of the rhetoric and pursuit of a policy of both engagement with and pressure on North Korea. President Trump went on to send a direct message to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un threatening to destroy the Asian nation if the U.S. is forced to defend itself and its allies from a nuclear attack. The United States has great strength and patience. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. The United States is ready, willing, and able. But hopefully, this will not be necessary. That's what the United Nations is all about. That's what the United Nations is for. Let's see how they do. On Donald Trump's staff talking address, uh, let's go live to United Nations where viewers Margaret Bashir is standing by. Now, Margaret, the president talked about other things, but it looks like his aggressive speech appeared to be aimed directly at the leadership in North Korea, Iran, and Syria, right? That was a very unambiguous message he sent to the rocket man, definitely. <laughs> Kim Jong un is on notice. Yes. Now, in terms of uh, the expectations, uh, you know, there might have been other things that people wanted to hear the president talk about, some of the issues that have been of concern to world leaders. Did that come through besides this? Well, I think leading up to the speech, usually it's the first time a U.S. president speaks here, there's a lot of excitement. Uh, I've been here for all of President Obama's administration, and people were always really excited to hear from him, especially his first year. It was absolute madness here. But I think this year, people were um, a little anxious about what they might hear from Donald Trump because he's a bit of a, a wild card, so to speak. And uh, so I think some people will be relieved. He stuck to the teleprompter. He delivered a very presidential, uh, dignified speech. But at the same time, they're going to be a little concerned about some of the content. Uh, threatening to totally destroy another UN member state is, is a strong language indeed. Uh, his language on the Iran nuclear deal, calling it a big embarrassment for the United States. States, uh, hinting that he may not uh, recertify it next month when it comes up for that in the U.S. He could try and pull the U.S. out of that deal. We did not hear from him about climate change. That's a big issue. A lot of countries were waiting to hear about it. The U.S. 
has indicated with the new administration that it plans to pull out of the Paris Accord. They're waiting for confirmation of this. There's been some back and forth on it in the last few days in the media here from uh, UN, uh, from U.S. officials. So no uh, decision either way from Mr. Trump today on climate change. We didn't hear him criticize Russia. You know, Russia has been a big uh, story in the United States. The Russians meddled in our elections. Uh, the president did not criticize Russia. He made an, a small allusion to the Russians and the Chinese, saying that there's a threat to sovereignty from the Ukraine to the South China Sea. So a little swipe at both Russia and China. But also he thanked them for their support uh, getting uh, economic sanctions against North Korea in the Security Council. So a mixed bag. Also mentioned the crisis in Myanmar that has erupted in the last month with the Rohingya Muslims. In a few seconds, uh, how about the African leaders? Buhari spoke there and later on Alan Johnson. What stood out? Well, I thought President Buhari still looked a bit weak, uh, not fully recovered, maybe uh, very thin and uh, labored in his speech. He did uh, talk about North Korea, and he suggested that a U.N. Security Council delegation should go to Pyongyang and talk to Kim Jong-un because this is such a serious crisis. And he also addressed the Myanmar uh, situation. Nigeria has a large uh, Muslim population, and he called for an end to the ethnic cleansing there. Well, Margaret, thank you very much as always. Well, because President Trump went where no American president has gone before in his first speech to the General Assembly at the UN, the president threatened to, quote, totally destroy North Korea if provoked. The United States has great strength and patience, but if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. All right, joining us now to discuss this is CNN national security analyst General Michael Hayden. Mr. Hayden was previously the director of the CIA as well as the NSA. General, thanks so much for being here. What did Good you morning. think of President Trump's speech? Well, you know, actually, Allison, it was, it was fairly complex. Now, there's been a lot of emphasis on the style, which was confrontational, combative, nationalistic. And I think that was an important message. I mean, I think what we learned is that the export version of President Trump looks an awful lot like the domestic version. And so you get this kind of over-the-top language with regard to North Korea, rocket man, total destruction. But, but, you know, if you sit and you read the speech, I think there's some important distinctions here. In that part of the speech, and I think, I think this is critical, the president used that very aggressive language, which frankly I think was a bit excessive, in terms of defense against a North Korean attack. But when he got over here to talk about the denuclearization of the peninsula, he emphasized diplomatic means, economic needs, political means, uh, political isolation. And so for the first time, we've got the president frankly sounding a little bit like Secretary Mattis, who's been really tough, but he's also made a clear distinction between responding to an attack and then working to cap the North Korean nuclear program. Well, and that's why on the diplomatic front, what has been said by the president and people around him about the Iran deal looms large. Make the connection to why what the U.S. does with respect to whether or not they should stay in the Iran deal, what's your take on that, and how that projects onto the North Korea situation. Sure, sure, Chris. And that was the other really substantive, concrete, specific part of the speech, where he really criticized the Iranian deal as an embarrassment uh, to the United States and so on. And again, I think the language is a bit over the top. Now, truth in lending here, I wasn't a real big fan of the deal, but I don't think it's a good idea for our going in there now and, frankly, what the president threatened was to decertify the deal for us to walk away from it. Look, if the off-ramp over here, because we don't want to go to war in Northeast Asia, if the off-ramp over here is negotiations with the United States, why are you over here trying to prove to the world that the United States is not a stable negotiating partner, that we would walk away from a deal made by the previous administration. And do you feel like these, a speech like this does move the needle somehow? I mean, do you think that what the president said did sway some other leaders' thinking? You know, I, I was thinking about that, Allison, and I think there, there are maybe three groups, two of them pretty small. 
you got a couple of groups over here, the Iranians and, and, the, and the North Koreans, who really got some messages there and were totally opposed. And frankly, their chiefs of delegation didn't even show up. And then you have Benjamin Netanyahu over here, who was in the seats cheering the president on. I think for the vast majority of the General Assembly, they left the meeting yesterday still unclear about presidential policy. You know, the president ran more on attitude than he did on specific policy directions. We kind of had that yesterday in the UN General Assembly. So I, I think a lot of folks in there were made a bit nervous because not all the ambiguity was cleared up by the president's speech. Let's get your take on what's happening with the special uh, counsel Mueller and the revelation that Manafort had a FISA warrant, maybe multiple warrants on him. What do you make of the scope of that? Yeah, obviously it's, it's, it's very important, Chris, and, and kudos to, to the network for coming out with that story a couple of days ago. But, but, you know, I'm trying to focus on the fine print to get the actual clarity as to what is really going on here. Now, now, now Chris, there are two kinds of warrants that the U.S. government can, can go get in order to listen to the conversations of an American. And sometimes our language isn't quite precise. And so I really would like to know, I would really like to ask the question, was this a warrant we got for criminal purposes, which suggests this is just part of that long money laundering relationship with the Ukrainian government thing? Or did we get a warrant because we believed Mr. Manafort to be the agent of a foreign power, which then suggests we've got a much warmer trail in terms of collaboration with the Russians. My instincts, my instincts are it's over here. It's a criminal warrant for activity not directly related to the campaign. Mm. But I think that's a big question. All right. General Hayden, thank you very much. Always great to talk to you. Thank you. All right. So Hurricane Maria is battering Puerto Rico. Whether he would borrow from recent tweets, make dire threats to North Korea, echo some of the name, calling it the campaign, or restate the America First platform he campaigned and won on, you can rest easy. That's what he did. Today, making his first speech to the U.N. General Assembly, he did all that to the point it left some delegates taken aback and caused emotional reaction in the chamber, apparently, as a senior U.N. official put it to our Jim Shudo. Here's a small sample. As President of the United States, I will always put America first. Just like you, as the leaders of your countries, will always and should always put your countries first. If the righteous many do not confront the wicked few, then evil will triumph. The United States has great strength and patience. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. Well, the president also put Iran on notice, calling the multilateral nuclear deal the U.S. is a party to, quote, an embarrassment to the United States. He said some nations were, in his words, going to hell. The speech set off a wave of reaction across the political spectrum. From the left, the Atlantic's Peter Beinart writes it turned President Obama's foreign policy vision on its head. On the right, the National Review's Rich Lowry opened his piece with this, quote, As someone said on Twitter, never before has been, uh, has been there so much murmuring of holy expletive in so many different languages. With that in mind, I want to get New York Times' columnist Tom, uh, Tom Friedman's take. He's the best-selling author most recently of Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist Guide to Thriving in the Age of Accelerations. Tom, overall, I'm wondering what you made of the president's speech today. Well, yeah, it's a worldview that I just don't share, Anderson. It, uh, the worldview that the president articulated is uh, America first. Um, and I think we became a prosperous and secure country ever since World War II in particular by being America the most connected. And, and I think in a world where... Um, uh, networks are, are uh, basically becoming the center of our lives and what flows through that network, uh, ideas, trade, um, opportunity. Uh, the country that's most connected to the most networks uh, is the country that's going to be uh, the most thriving and, and uh, the most secure. And, and I just don't agree with the president's point of view. I also think the speech was larded with contradictions. Uh, uh, others have pointed this out. You know, the president says now, you know, the first thing is sovereignty. Countries have to respect each other's sovereignty. And one really is tempted to ask uh, President President Trump, really? Um, we, we had the biggest nonviolent attack on our sovereignty by Russia during the last election, according to our three leading
leading intelligence agencies uh, that our country's ever experienced, and he is he is yet to really condemn that. Uh, and the other contradiction is um, he basically signaled that he is uh, wants to rip up the Iran deal and, and, and apparently intends to do so, the Iran nuclear deal, one that has uh, uh, denuclearizes Iran effectively, uh, prevents it from getting a nuclear weapon for, for 15 years, essentially. Um, and at the same time, we're going to we're going to uh, persuade North Korea to voluntarily give up its nuclear weapons. If you're sitting in North Korea and you see that the United States struck a deal with Iran, Iran uh, gave up its nuclear option, and now the United States wants to tear that up, uh, that's not going to really work in great harmony with uh, your North Korea diplomacy. So that's my general reaction. The, this notion of America first, and, and I mean, you know, it's something, it sort of echoes something else he said during the campaign about kind of not dictating to other countries um, or not sort of being the the, certainly the world's policeman, but also not sort of trying to change or nation build in, in other countries. Um, is that something which, uh, do you think he, he actually believes that? Because, I mean, obviously there are many countries where the U.S. is involved with and, and is trying to dictate terms on, on how they should behave and, and what they should do. Yeah, it's just not particularly thought out. Obviously, we're telling the Iranians how to behave, but we're not telling the Saudis how to behave. And, um, uh, you know, both of them have problematic uh, domestic um, uh, issues as far as we're concerned, and, and even international ones. So none of it, Anderson, feels deely thought out to me. It, it starts with a, a kind of, uh, you know, catchphrase, America first, and then uh, it attempts to build a kind of global foreign policy around it. Uh, it. It doesn't strike me as very deep, and it flies in the face of how we built a world that has been largely peaceful, if one looks at the broad span of world history, and made us largely prosperous uh, ever since World War II. It, it, it argues that there is a completely different approach. And so what do you think are the odds? that every one of our statesmen since, our greatest statesmen since World War II, who built American prosperity and security on the idea of making a much more inclusive world shaped around our values and, and really our interests, that they got it all wrong, but Donald Trump and Breitbart got it right. You know, there are some uh, supporters of Trump who will listen to what he said uh, about North Korea and say, well, look, you know, maybe these kind of, this kind of threat, it will work. I mean, nothing else seems to have worked, uh, they would point out, through multiple administrations which have tried kind of different tactics on this. Well, you know, I want to take up that specific point because I think there they have a point. I, I don't, Rocket Man is kind of juvenile, but whatever, maybe behind it is a is a feeling that we need to shrink this guy, you know, in North Korea, not build him up. So, you know, put a nickname on him and, um, uh, and, and making him afraid of, of what Trump may or may not do. I don't. I don't have a, a problem with that. The, the 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 real question is: Is there a, a long-term strategy other than living with North Korea with a nuclear bomb? Are we really ready to go to war over that? I I, I just don't know. I, I sense so, Anderson, in, in what the president said, what I've heard Mattis say uh, in the last 24 hours. We may be approaching a point where we will say to the North Koreans, the next rocket you test, the next ballistic missile you test um, near uh, one of our allies, particularly China and South Korea, we are going to take out the launcher. Um, and, uh, and then you put the North Koreans in a situation where they have to decide if they retaliate by taking out the launcher, they are beginning a process that could end up indeed in their own suicide. The one thing that has made me, you know, uh, uh, slightly, somewhat hopeful that this doesn't have to come to a, a, a violent solution in, in the Korean Peninsula is the fact that North Korea is a three-generation dynasty. It, it's now been ruled by three generations of the same family. That suggests to me that this family is not suicidal, it's homicidal. And um, I do believe that that gives us some room for maneuver. I, it's not, I wouldn't bet the wife and kids on it, but it does suggest that at the end of the day, these guys aren't in the business of committing suicide. Mm. Tom Friedman, thank you very much. Thank you. We're following closely.